So hello everyone, uh, I'm Rakesh. I work in pricing team at Lyft uh, and I'm here to present on a case study of uh, machine learning and be, uh, machine learning and streaming on Beam. So here's the agenda uh, or, or what are the top topics that I'm going to cover in this presentation. So uh, I'll go over the dynamic pricing and what is the legacy uh, pricing infrastructure and then the streaming use case and streaming based infrastructure or uh, a based infrastructure that we uh, are currently using. And then uh, Beam uh, Flink Runner, uh, I'll just try to cover some basic of Beam Flink Runner and then uh, at the very end uh, I'll talk about lesson learned. So uh, before we uh, go over uh, everything, uh, I just wanted to give a kind of quick introduction about Lyft. So Lyft is a ride sharing company, our goal is to basically <coughs> match uh, passenger with drivers uh, and also keep them happy. Uh, that means, uh, that, uh, that means, uh, to basically ensure that both drivers and passengers are happy. Uh, how? Basically by uh, providing a fair pricing for the ride and also make sure that uh, uh, drivers are uh, getting fair uh, earning from the ride. Uh, and also we have to make sure that uh, whatever the rides we provide, the whole ETA is like smaller. And so in order to ensure all these things, we have to take several decisions in real time. And, and that is possible using streaming. Uh, there are some other use cases as well. Uh, so, for example, we also want to uh, notify users uh, for different events. Say, for example, uh, if there is a coupon available and we want to push out, we want to notify users that there are coupons that you, they can use it. Similarly, for drivers, uh, we want to notify them there is a ride available and if they can accept the ride and then they can serve the ride as well. Similarly, if there is any cancel from driver, we also want to notify user that the ride is canceled and then they can request the ride again. Uh, similarly, uh, we also want to detect some uh, fraud on our platform. Uh, it also has some uh, severe monetary impact because if we don't detect fraud, uh, we will be paying uh, uh, money and uh, it will have a severe impact on our finance. Uh, uh, how we detect fraud is basically we are looking into an, uh, users' behavior anomalies and we try to detect it. One example could be if a user is continuously adding multiple credit cards, we try to detect such kind of uh, behavior in real time. And, uh, and our system basically detects all these behavior and they try to prevent uh, by putting some preventive measure in place. Okay, that is more about the background. Uh, uh, and I want you to talk about the dynamic pricing. Uh, what is dynamic pricing? Dynamic pricing is basically a price which changes based on certain constraint or environment or uh, different uh, attributes. So we call dynamic pricing at Lyft as a prime time or uh, also kind of search pricing. So what is prime time? So prime time is a basically a kind of a, a multiplier. It is a location and time specific multiplier uh, on a, any base fare uh, of a ride. So uh, for example, uh, at, uh, say for example, uh, you have a ride uh, in SF downtown at 5 p.m., which is also kind of a peak commuter time. And if the prime time is two, that means uh, your base fare will be double. Uh, it's kind of bad, uh, uh, and I'll explain why we do that. Uh, location, uh, we take location and talent, uh, time over here. Location, we treat, uh, we don't take latitude and longitude. Uh, we use basically convert that latitude, longitude into geohashes. Geohashes is basically a kind of, you can treat that one as a kind of a rectangular blocks. So in that rectangular block, uh, whatever latitude, longitude, uh, they will have exactly the same geohash. As you can see over here, there are rectangular blocks all over the place. So those are like one particular geohash, and you can uniquely identify all of them. And uh, geohash, uh, the string, alphanumeric string, that can vary from one character to 12 character long. One character which can represent the entire globe, and 12 characters up to a uh, few centimeters. Our models, our pricing models, basically work on all uh, geohash six. That means all these geohashes will have six character long. Okay, uh, so why do we need prime time? Uh, and our question will be, why you're making rides so, so expensive? Uh, and people might assume that, uh, in a way, a lift is earning money by making the ride uh, expensive. Uh, it is not completely true. Uh, we would prefer not to do this. Uh, but we have to do it uh, uh, because we want to maintain a demand and supply balance. I can give you an example why we do it. So for, say for example, um, 
there is bad weather or a kind of concert gets out, suddenly there is a lot of request and there will be a different amount of or different numbers of drivers in per that particular area. And if we serve all the requests, we will consume all the drivers and driver won't be available. So in subsequent minutes, uh, all the passengers who are trying to request the ride will not get the ride immediately. Basically, they have to wait. All the driver from distance area, we have to dispatch those drivers to pick up uh, passengers. If you are doing that, uh, that means drivers, they have to travel a long time to pick up the passenger. It's a not good user experience for uh, driver. And for passenger, because the ETA is getting longer, like they are probably spending 15 minutes waiting to just get a ride and then for more minutes to uh, in the ride itself. So it's not a kind of a good user uh, good user experience for both of them. So in order to ensure that they have a good user experience, we want to have a kind of a prime time so that, uh, you know, to balance out demand and supply. In a way, we want to filter out uh, passengers who are not very serious about it or, and only serve those passengers who are really serious, they really want to get the ride. And for a driver, say for example, if they are traveling a lot and then they are getting paid only for providing the ride. So when they are traveling to pick up any passenger, they are not getting paid. And if they have to travel a lot to pick up passengers, that's a kind of a bad, a bad experience for them or they are not getting fair uh, earning, right? So they will be mad and at some point they will just quit the platform and then this situation will get aggravated. So it will be a kind of catastrophic failure for the uh, platform. So that's why we have a prime time in order to balance our demand and supply. So when we are prime timing, we are also providing that money, whatever the extra money we are charging from passenger, we are passing on to a driver. So in a way, we are also keeping drivers in on the platform. So these are also, this prime time is dynamic. It changes based on the current situation, condition of the uh, marketplace. And marketplace is mostly kind of how many drivers are available, how many passengers are, are making requests, right? Or requesting for a ride. Uh, there's a really nice paper on this one. It's about search pricing solves uh, the wild goose chase. Uh, if you're really interested, you should uh, definitely check out this paper. So uh, that is about like more background about like uh, why we have a uh, prime time. And now I, I want to dive deeper into uh, uh, what is the infrastructure uh, uh, that uh, basically calculates, uh, uh, calculate the prime time. So I'll just go over the uh, legacy infrastructure first. Uh, so before I dive into this one, uh, I just uh, superficially said uh, we are just monitoring demand and supply, but there are a lot of things goes into uh, uh, this computation. For example, um, say uh, we look into demand and supply, we are definitely getting the, the, that signal. But as I mentioned before, we don't want to consume all the driver in the same minute. We also want to keep a reserve of drivers for the next minute. So we want to ensure if you're keeping those driver uh, reserve for the next minute, we are basically providing, uh, setting some kind of SLA, ET SLA, and we want to ensure that we satisfy that SLA. And that is really important for our passenger user experience. At the same time, we also want to see what is the current conversion rate. That means how many people are basically looking at the app and how many people out of them is basically making a request, right? So we want to figure out what is the current conversion rate. At the same time, we also want to see like, uh, what is the uh, effect of prime time on the conversion? So if I say 50%, then how many people are converting? So that way. So it's more kind of dynamic and uh, our machine learning models are basically looking into all these parameters and trying to find a kind of optimal prime time that will basically maximize the throughput and also maximize the demand. So that is more about the, uh, how our models work, uh, but how do we get all these signals to the model? So we get all these signals in terms of events, and all these events are basically coming from the user's app or passenger's app, driver's app, and in some cases, some of our services which are generating all these events. And these events are all funneled through our Kinesis worker. So Kinesis worker is basically hooked up to Kinesis stream, and they are ingesting all these events. And then, uh, so all these workers, there are several workers uh, in the pipeline or in the legacy pipeline, 
which are basically a kind of a cron job, uh, which was running uh, every top of the minute. So they will just get up, consume the data, run uh, run something. Uh, if it is aggregation worker, it will try to aggregate all this data and then uh, uh, put that aggregated feature in the Redis. And if it is model, it was getting all these input and sto uh, storing that output in the kind of Redis. So um, inherently, this model has a problem because it is getting, like all these workers are getting at the top of the minute and running it. And they are basically getting the input from the prior minute. So inherently, there is some delay. Say, for example, in this case, if aggregation worker gets up and aggregate the, all these events and generate the aggregated data, and it finishes in five seconds, so the next model, or say model one worker, will consume uh, after 45 seconds, right? So there's a kind of inherent delay. And it's a kind of problematic because if you're delaying all these things and, uh, and putting the prime time later, then you are taking more, longer time to basically balance the market. And it can, have, uh, it, like, it can have a kind of adverse effect on the marketplace. So that's why uh, we wanted to have something else, something which uh, can solve this problem and also run faster. Uh, so that is more about background. Uh, and then at the very end, uh, like uh, this is like a sequence of all the models are running. And uh, there are intermediate models as well. So these intermediate models uh, basically get, they get the uh, aggregated feature and they compute some decision variable. And that decision variable is passed on to the PD model. PD is a prime time model, uh, which basically gets all these uh, uh, decision variable and finally computes the prime time. And these models or these workers are also running uh, on a kind of abstraction on region. That means if a one uh, worker instance is running, that is basically computing the value for that particular region. And they're uh, computing on geohash level. Okay, and once a PD model is done, then it basically uh, get the prime time and then it stores in a kind of a, a geohash dictionary in the Redis. And all the other downstream services basically provide the geohash and then they can get a, a, a prime time and then they pass it on to the uh, uh, user application. To give you uh, more about the scale at which we are working, so right now uh, we are basically calculating 100 uh, hundreds of feature for one particular geohash. And in one minute, we process almost 3 million geohashes. So in a day, we are computing almost 400 billion uh, uh, features. But that uh, legacy infrastructure that had worked uh, in past, like very beginning when we started, uh, models were very simple and used to work very fine. But over time, uh, models, they got more complicated and then we are start taking into account of our different signals, and then we introduce more intermediate models. So there is a kind of, a, we introduce a kind of a DAG in between as well. So if we, it get more complicated and we are adding more and more uh, worker in between, the latency in the longest part of the DAG will be highest, and it could be several minutes as well, which is not kind of good for us. So that's why we say, okay, uh, we need to get into another architecture which can run faster. So uh, some of the uh, problem with that one is definitely latency that I explained. And then code complexity as well. Uh, when we are aggregating data, we were just using some black magic of Redis uh, key and then <laughs> aggregating all these things. And it is mostly like you're coding or writing code to aggregate all these values. Some of the constructs are already available on the streaming uh, infrastructure, which can do this operation or like it has a kind of generic operator that can do it for you, and like uh, it could be done in one or two lines of code. So we thought, okay, why not we use streaming then? Uh, and then uh, we also now have a kind of a very good way of joining all these events. We are doing like basically coding everything, trying to figure out what is the join, how it should be done, and then a bunch of other operation. It was like kind of a, if you have more code, that means you, it will be more error prone. And there were no smart triggers. As I mentioned before, like every worker was running on top of minute. So if the data is available, it will not run. Like it is just waiting for the next minute. So there is no smart trigger. So uh, we thought about it. What is a uh, better uh, architecture which can solve all these problems? We thought, OK, streaming uh, provides all these uh, features. And that can work. And we also had a kind of streaming uh, stack at Lyft. 
I can just talk about uh, Flink uh, and uh, what is the current stack. So uh, this is the stack or what we had. Uh, so uh, for source, we had Kinesis and Kafka, uh, and all these events are coming through that one. And then we had Flink. Some of the pipeline were also written uh, for different services to run the uh, uh, streaming application. And then all these uh, streaming application, they are uh, generating and passing all this data to either uh, uh, Amazon S3, Kafka, or Elasticsearch. But for us, it was slightly different. Uh, we basically wanted to run uh, pricing models. All these models are machine learning models, and they are written in Python. Can you run a kind of uh, a Python on Flink? It's, the answer is no. Like, because uh, all these uh, Flink or big data ecosystems, they are based on JVM, and you cannot run Python on JVM. Like, it cannot write, uh, you cannot directly run on them. So that was kind of big, uh, biggest problem. The another one was like team had more Java expert, uh, Python expertise, and training them, and then bringing up to speed and writing uh, 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 Java pipeline could be difficult, and probably a kind of a longer project as well. So that was not a kind of a good fit. And then uh, we can have you can have used Jiten or uh, Jiten, but that is also not a good fit uh, for that one. And then uh, we had to maintain a kind of a different uh, environment as well. So that was so we were thinking like what is the way we can solve this problem. We can keep the model in Python, but we can still use kind of a streaming infrastructure. So yeah, so Beam came to rescue us. So Beam basically allowed, it's a kind of a, I think you have already gone through this present, or like similar kind of presentation. So Beam is providing kind of abstract uh, or unified API to basically write your uh, pipeline in different language, and you can run on any uh, uh, engine or streaming engine. So similarly, we can still use our stack. We just need to have a kind of beam in place. So, and then, uh, so this, uh, I think we have already seen this one, but again, like those who have not gone through this one, I just want to repeat. Uh, so you can write uh, your pipeline in either Java, SQL, Python, Go, and then it can be converted into a protos, and then it can run uh, any of the streaming engine. And here it is more in depth. So you basically write the, uh, your uh, SDK, oh, sorry, your pipeline using one of your, uh, or whatever language you choose. For us, we chose uh, Python. And we, uh, are like once you submit the uh, pipeline, basically the runner translator will convert that pipeline into more uh, environment agnostic way. It's basically a kind of a, a proto definition. And then uh, it will uh, also go to the runner, a runner will basically create a job graph which is in kind of native language and it will submit it to Flink. And then uh, a runner also uh, supplies different operator for FN API and also it manages all the SDK workers and then uh, bundle execution. And then SDK workers are basically, they are running in their native language environment and they are executing. So in a way you can define a kind of Python UDF and then it will get executed by the uh, SDK worker. So, but uh, Beam, uh, we couldn't use uh, it out of the box. We had to do some customization. We had to do a uh, translation extension for our streaming sources like uh, Kafka and Kinesis. Uh, that, uh, and we were using Kafka and Kinesis already for our other uh, Flink uh, uh, jobs. And we had to make some modification there, uh, uh, basically message decoding and watermarking. So message decoding, uh, in Kinesis, whenever we send a message, we basically encode that message. So if you are consuming in a Beam application, and if you're using any connector, then you have to decode that message, also extract out the occur dat or even time, and based on that, you also move watermarks. And then Python execution environment, we also had to modify a little bit. Uh, and it was it is more tailored to run for our CI CD. Uh, and it is Docker free. Uh, it is basically all these SDK worker, they are running as a kind of separate process. And uh, we also had a worker recycling logic, which is also merged to uh, mainstream. Uh, worker recycling is also kind of interesting. So if you're writing any application in Python, you will definitely run into some memory issue. And we had run into a couple of them. Like I, initially we tried to solve it, but it is really difficult to identify the problem and quickly fix the problem. 
And these problem were not coming from our application. It was mostly from third party uh, library. And on Python, we don't have a very kind of a good tool to basically identify the memory uh, issue. It takes time, uh, and sometimes you have to rebuild Python and then probably enable some flags, then use some kind of system level tools to grab the logs and figure out where exactly the memory leak is happening, find the library, patch it, and then it will take a longer time to basically uh, fix the problem around it. And if you have a very short project uh, duration, then that is not going to work. So what we came up with, the kind of a worker recycling. That means you can configure the worker uh, for a certain duration, say 24 hours or something, and that worker will get recycled. That means uh, it will probably consume some memory, and then once it gets recycled, that memory will uh, reclaim again. So in that way, you can have the pipeline running for a longer time. And all these customizations are already here on this branch. So if you want to check uh, our customization, what, what we have done with them, you can check there. And I think this is the latest branch right now. Hmm. Uh, so streaming-based pricing infrastructure, that is more about uh, what was available uh, at Lyft and how we have used it. So this is, uh, if you look at the picture, uh, this, uh, in terms of operation, we are doing the similar kind of operation, but instead of worker, like running each piece in one instance or one worker, we are running that in pipeline. And this pipeline was there in production. So uh, as you can see, uh, all these uh, events are generated uh, by the devices or services, and that it gets into Kinesis. And at the very beginning of the pipeline, we had a, a filtration in place to just make sure that uh, if any uh, rogue client is sending kind of a, a not kind of invalid event, we can filter out those events. And uh, those are also done with the kind of service calls. So we make a bunch of service calls, make sure that the event or uh, the, the events are looking good. And once that is done, then we pass it into the pipeline. And then we have aggregation aggregation logic in place, which is basically aggregating all these features and generating aggregated feature. And then at the very end, we have a kind of a models uh, DAG, uh, where these models are grabbing uh, all these uh, aggregated feature, run it, and then generate the decision variable and pass it. So over here in this picture, it looks very similar, like there's one. But in reality, there are two or three different layers uh, in model execution part. So one is definitely first one is first set of models are uh, directly getting all these aggregated uh, features, running it, creating decision variable, passing in the pipeline at the way, and then the other part of the pipeline where you define all the dependencies, what are the decision variable you need, and then once you have received all these decision variable, then you execute the model and then generate the pipeline. So this is what it was there in production. Okay. Uh, a detail of implementation filtering. So filtering, uh, as I mentioned, uh, we are also doing service calls, a uh, couple of service calls uh, uh, from, uh, to basically get the source of truth. And then uh, uh, we are also doing stateful processing. Sometimes it is uh, or it based on the use case as well. Sometimes we need to know the current state of the user. Say, for example, whether the user is in ride or not, whether a uh, driver has dropped or not, some kind of thing. So you don't get that information. Like you have to basically join a couple of events to extract out that uh, information. So uh, stateful processing was really helpful over there to basically uh, keep the state and figure out what is the current state of the user or driver. Then uh, triggering is uh, right now based on watermarking uh, and uh, stateful processing. So those who don't know about watermark is, watermark is basically a kind of estimation of when we have seen all the event up to this time and you can start processing. In a way, you are basically signaling that, okay, we are done with uh, ingestion. Now you can basically run the computation for the given uh, window. And stateful processing, in some cases, uh, we wanted to trigger it early. We don't want to wait for the watermark to move. So in that way, uh, stateful processing really helpful. I'll give you an example in later uh, part of the presentation. And um, at the very end, uh, machine learning models are also uh, uh, invoke using uh, stateful beam. I'll give you an example in this slide, later in the slides. And finally, store, uh, finally uh, the output is stored in Redis. Okay, uh, I think I talked a lot about stateful processing. Uh, so stateful processing, uh, or I should step back a little. So um, most of the operation in streaming is kind of stateless. That means 
any operator it doesn't know about the previous uh, information it just executed and but in some cases you want to store some information in the node so then stateful processing comes into picture you basically store you can store associate some information and then you can retrieve say for example if you want to count of uh, uh, count or something uh, based on particular key like how many times you have seen this key or something like that you can do that uh, using that stateful processing similarly like as i mentioned uh, in, in order to determine the state of a user, we can basically look into several events and figure out, okay, this is the current state of it. You can do that over here. Basically, you can st store the information on the node and then you can retrieve it as well. And this also helped us to basically early execution. That means uh, once all these decision variables or dependencies are met for a model, they can run the model uh, immediately instead of waiting for the watermark. I, I can show you some example, and then stateful processing also comes with some performance costs. Uh, there's one uh, we figure out there's uh, some problems with stateful processing, and we filed here a uh, ticket. Uh, Max is uh, actively working on this one, uh, and uh, I can share some more information on that one in the lesson learned part of this presentation. And then, if you run into kind of some kind of performance issue where the stateful processing is slower, you can probably uh, increase the higher or increase the bundle size and probably you will get a better throughput. And then uh, you should be also careful of when you're using stateful uh, operator, uh, data skewness can add latency. That means if you're, if one operator or one shard is getting too much of data, it can slow down your system as well. Because the nature of the stateful is like it's chatty, it is basically trying to uh, send or receive the data from the backend. And that can cause some problem. But we are uh, trying to solve these problems in that year. Uh, like, uh, like we have already proposed one cross-bundle caching, and that will solve these problems. But whenever you design your application, you should always think about data skewness and how you are going to solve it. OK, so stateful processing, it's kind of uh, simple. You basically define what kind of state you want to use. Uh, there are a couple of states available. Uh, 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 in S Python SDK, uh, back state, uh, set state, uh, uh, map state is not available, but I think most of the th thing can be done in the back state. And we are right now using back state for our uh, early execution. And then we also have a, a timer spec. Uh, that means uh, you can set the timer like how you want to, or when you want to call the uh, callback. So in this case, uh, we want you to have this timer for watermark. Like once the watermark has, has moved, we want to call it. Uh, this logic is basically looking for, uh, what do you call it? It is keeping track of what are the input it has seen and how many, or what are the inputs that it needed to run the model execution, or model. So if it sees that uh, all these inputs are met, uh, you can see it on line over here, it's basically comparing all these, like what it needs and what other uh, input it has seen. If it matches, then it basically cancels the timer and then it runs the uh, model execution. In case, uh, it can happen in some scenarios where you have not seen all these uh, inputs, and even then the uh, watermark has passed. You don't want to keep waiting that state. You want to run, right? So that's why the watermark uh, timer will help you to basically uh, call this. So basically, watermark uh, callback method will call once the watermark moves, and then even then, uh, like once the timer has reached, then you basically uh, execute the model again. So this is more about uh, stateful processing. Uh, My clicker is not working. OK, lesson learned. Uh, so data skewness, as I was mentioning earlier, uh, in some cases, like uh, if you're using stateful, it can cause problem. So we had noticed a kind of problem in pipeline that uh, intermittently our latency increased from 15 seconds to uh, 70 seconds. And we figure out uh, by looking at like the watermark information and we figure out some of the shards were like slowing down the watermark movement. And eventually we try to grab uh, or like figure out uh, how many uh, elements are processed by those shards. And we noticed that uh, one of the shards was getting too much of elements or too many records. And that's why it was slowing down the whole watermark thing. As you can see, there is a gray line which is like jumping uh, suddenly. And then once it is going down, then the latency is also coming down through a normal state. So we figure out that this is the problem. 
uh, uh, it, was, it took some time for us to basically uh, drill down and figure out the exact problem. And we figured out that this is caused by the data skewness. That like one shot is getting too many records and it's not able to process it. I Means not able to process fast. So uh, uh, whenever you're designing your application, make sure that uh, keep your data skewness thing in mind and design the application accordingly. If there's a data skewness and one shot is getting too much or too many events or elements, it can have high latency because that shard will spend too much time to process all those elements. So basically, you design the application so it can evenly distribute the load on different shards. And then uh, you can also uh, try re, uh, re keying or resharding. That way, you can evenly distribute it. But it also depends on case to case basis. For us, like we figured it out that one type of event is basically getting processed, and that was really chatty or like kind of noisy event, and that event was enabled for debugging purpose, and we were not using it uh, anymore. Uh, and uh, and the another problem that we noticed that we were just saving tons of event, and we were filtering out 90% of our event at the middle of the pipeline. And we're like, why we are doing that one? Like, if you are not using them, why we are passing all the way to the middle? And we just move that logic at the very beginning of the pipeline, where we just drop all those events. Uh, and those events were like mostly for debugging purpose. We just drop all those events over there, and our latency was fine. And we could also fix that uh, intermittent latency issue. Then the, another problem is like, whenever you design a pipeline, you just uh, you need to have some kind of observability in place to see how your pipeline is uh, performing. Sometimes, like even a kind of a simple looking uh, code can cause problem. And uh, this is on based on my experience. Uh, so what we what happened is like we were looking into our latency. Uh, whenever we used to start the pipeline, it took the longer time to basically uh, catch up with all the event. And then we were like, okay, why it is taking so long to catch up? And when we uh, hook up Pipeflame, uh, Pipeflame is another performance measurement tool. You can basically uh, hook up to any Python uh, process using just, you just provide the uh, process ID and it can basically get the stack trace and it can, it can build this graph for you. And you can basically drill down like on the horizontal bars, it is basically telling you how long that is taking or that method is taking to get executed. And it can tell you uh, like uh, the, if the, bar is longer, you can, it can tell you that it is taking longer time too. And you, after carefully looking into it, you can figure out what are the methods in the application is taking longer time. So as I mentioned, there's sometimes like even simple looking code can take longer. In our case, what we have seen is like, uh, we are getting all these events and all these events had occurred at a field, which is basically a timestamp or kind of event time. And we were extracting out multiple places multiple places in the uh, pipeline and making some operation. And we noticed that the method which is used to parse the string and convert into daytime, it was taking longer time. And we were doing multiple times. I like, initially we thought like this should, like this is a straightforward thing, it should not take longer, but it was taking longer. So what we did is basically like, okay, we are going to convert it one time and we will just use it throughout the pipeline. So, uh, and then, there was another stupid performance improvement as well that we did, and that's kind of funny as well. So all these uh, timestamps, uh, they are like up to a second, right? And if you are receiving millions of records in one chart, and if, you're, if your uh, parsing is taking longer, you can basically have in TTL, the entire string, and you can have a corresponding value in the TTL. And that's how we solved that problem as well. So we did two, one is definitely, um, we are we are par doing parsing once, and we are also using TTL. So in that way, uh, the, uh, like even the simple uh, kind of improvement or kind of fix can solve or can give you a higher performance gain. And then, as I mentioned, so look at the uh, Pyflame graph, uh, minimize expensive operation as much as you can. Uh, that will definitely help you, and that also helps you like when you you are trying to bring up the pipeline and if it is reading from a really old events. So if your pipeline is uh, kind of really efficient, then it can catch up with the stream really fast. Uh, enable Cython. Uh, 
some of the matrix are generated if your environment has item and that is by beam so uh, initially when we were investigating all these later intermittent latency we couldn't get it but when we enable Cython, uh, it can generate. And there's a reason behind it. Like if you are generating too much of uh, matrix uh, from Beam framework, that can take a longer time, right? Uh, so that's why they had it only for Cython environment as well, where the Python program execution is a little bit faster. And uh, as I mentioned before, uh, filter out data early. If you don't need data in the pipeline, don't just pass it around in the pipeline. If you're passing it around in the pipeline, it will take uh, network bathroom and it can also slow you down. So uh, we are aggressively filtering out all the data which is not in the pipeline. That way we just trim, up, trim down all this data and we have only that data which is really necessary in the pipeline. We are also using protobuffer messages to basically compact the data and pass it around. So in a way, uh, you're reducing the amount of data. Uh, we also learned that a smaller pipeline will help you. Uh, so as in the very beginning, I showed you a bigger pipeline where we were doing everything like ingesting the event, aggregating the event, and running a model. But if you have a longer pipeline, uh, that cannot give you a kind of really good uh, performance benefit because different section of the pipeline, their characteristics are different, and uh, uh, tuning them will be really harder and tricky. But if you divide them based on their performance that can, uh, or their characteristic that will be really helpful in uh, like uh, customizing it further. For example, over here, uh, so right now this filtration or uh, we call it aggregated feature pipeline, which is basically ingesting all these events and aggregating it and then publishing into Kafka topic. So this one is more towards like processing more and more event, right? So over here, if you have a caching and everything in place, it will work. But later part of the pipeline, which is almost running in a minute and trying to compute the prime time, it is sl working slowly. But the same configuration might not work. There you need more kind of a scheduling work uniformly across the SDK worker. But over here uh, in the aggregation phase, you need more kind of faster processing. Probably having kind of cross bundle caching will improve the throughput. So, if you're defining the pipeline, you can customize it. Uh, and also, the development cycle for these two pipelines were different. Uh, so in aggregated feature, we don't uh, uh, add new features so frequently as compared to models. Uh, like model, almost every week, we come up with a new model. And we wanted to have a kind of separate pipeline where we can quickly integrate it and test it out. So that way, you have different development cycle as well, and you're not touching uh, the other part of the pipeline, which is which is not affected by that. And another benefit of this one is, earlier we used to generate all these aggregated feature and then pass it to the model. But there are other systems as well, or services as well, which used to get, calculate the same feature again, and they're using it. If you're having Kafka topic, you can publish this Kafka topic to other services. They can basically consume from your pipeline. So in a way, you're saving work for other teams. Can I ask you a question? Mm -hmm. So at any step in the pipeline, you might have a failure. How do you, first of all, detect the failures real time? And how do you, um, how do you mitigate or solve the issue? Uh, so what kind of failure you're? I mean, like you have some errors, uh, processing errors. You have. Uh, any, any type of failures, like uh, Kafka, if you say you have, uh, you have data errors, type of data that so we, uh, depending on the pipeline, uh, like what part, part of the pipeline we are doing, uh, in some cases, say for example, uh, internal web service call, we have a retry in place as well. Uh, and we, in most of the cases, we do have some kind of backend mechanism or some kind of uh, kind of retry mechanism in place to do it. And it's more also kind of a use a case to case basis. But in catastrophic failure, like say entire pipeline fail, then what we do is we go five minutes back and then we start consuming from there. And the reason behind is uh, basically we don't care about the late data. All our models are caring about the fresh data. So, and we uh, go back five minutes basically because some of our aggregation is based on five minutes window as well. And when we want to restart our pipeline, we want to have a complete data set instead of like 
if you start from like one minute ago, but the five minute aggregation will not work because it will not have uh, complete data. So uh, I think it is also case to case basis. You have to look into it, like uh, what kind of failure it is and how you want to mitigate. Like internal web service codes, for example. Mm -hmm. um, you re I mean, you retry, but then you could they cause a backlog maybe in your. Uh, so uh, that's a good question. Um, for internal services, we have a couple of them, and uh, we determine based on a couple of uh, things. Uh, we b basically figure out whether this is really important or not important. So say, for example, uh, uh, location-related thing. So location, uh, there is another service called location, and we try to validate the, uh, the whether the location contained in the event is valid or not. If it doesn't, if the location call fail for some reason, and we try a couple of times, and it fail, it is fine. We, we just ignore that one and we just move on. But in some cases where the model is completely failing and we are not doing uh, able to do it, uh, we have another fallback mechanism on the service side as well. Uh, yeah. Lesson learned. Uh, so keep a pipe and simple. Uh, fling task or shuffles are not uh, free. So when initially we we started writing uh, pipeline, um, our engineers did not have uh, experience about the streaming uh, application and how they work. So we started using shuffle and group and everything. We thought it's just for free, but when we put it in production, it didn't work. And obviously, uh, it will not work because if you are adding too much shuffle, go group by key, group by key, combine all these operators, which are basically either shuffling the data around uh, net. Uh, in network or uh, or sending any data across the network, it comes with a performance impact. And also, like um, all these task manager in Flink, they have a definite uh, network memory, and the network memory usage increased quadratically if you use more shuffle in your pipeline. So whenever you use shuffle, you should be mindful of like, how much memory you are going to consume. So try to use less shuffling, or try to re-architect your application to use less shuffling. Then uh, model simulation latency matters. Uh, Sometimes if any operator in your pipeline is taking too long time, it can cause back pressure. So you have to identify all these operators and design your application accordingly, or probably increase your parallelism. So it's based on that. And, uh, yeah. Uh, that is it, um, and then uh, instruct everything for uh, instrument everything for monitoring. When we have pipeline and pipeline is running, uh, but in some cases it can fail, and you don't know where exactly it failed, what happened, and uh, if you don't have monitoring in place, it's really hard to debug the pipeline in distributed uh, distributed uh, system. So what we do is we we have stats D for each individual operator, so we can effectively check each and every operator that how much uh, event or it is processing and how much it is spitting out. So in a way, you can verify each and every operator. And it also helps, like many times, it helped us to identify the issue quickly. Instead of like running in production and don't know what's going to happen or which operator is causing and then you're bringing back in uh, kind of development environment and running it, uh, it will take longer time. But if you have the monitoring or observability in place, it will help you to debug issues faster. And also I wanted to point out here is like, when you're writing all these pipelines, uh, sometimes it's much easier to run in development environment, and you see it, it's working, but when you deploy in production, it will fail, there will be some production issue, uh, like scalability issue in place. So it's better to have an environment where you can load test your pipeline. And it gives you a confidence as well that when you are deploying a pipeline in production, it will work. And uh, if you have that kind of environment, you, it's much easier to debug there as well. We already have a kind of parallel environment where we can run our pipeline, make sure everything is fine, and then we deploy in production. And, and <laughs> approach, you should define your approach for when you're restarting a pipeline, what should happen when upgrade. For our case, uh, when we restart our pipeline, it's much clear, uh, uh, what do you call clear for us that we wanted only five minute old data, but it can be uh, use case dependent. In some cases, you want to have a kind of a checkpoint enable, so that means when you bring down your pipeline 
and bring up the pipeline again, you want to start from the same checkpoint. And this is more for the consistency of the data. And then uh, mind your dependencies. Uh, say, for example, in our pipeline, we are calling a bunch of services uh, to verify or filter out events. And if you have such kind of dependencies, um, it's kind of lethal if you restart your pipeline, suddenly the pipeline is sending too many requests to those services, and that can bring down those services if you don't have rate limit or throttling in place. And since you're bringing up the environment, and you, uh, sorry, bringing up the pipeline, and it is reading tons of data and sending a lot of requests to your service, services may not have enough time to scale up. So it's really important to have the rate limit and uh, throttling in place. And I think I already covered about the testing story. You definitely need a kind of environment where you can load test your pipeline and find any uh, bottlenecks. And then uh, what next? Uh, moving on to okay, it's for better deployment story. Um, we have already uh, open sourced uh, Flink 8 operator. Micah, uh, this morning, he has already covered uh, what we are doing. And then Thomas is also working on the, uh, Porting Beam to Kubernetes uh, infrastructure. And uh, there is a kind of a technical spec written. You can go and check out that link. And then we are also working on the cross bundle caching uh, to increase the throughput of the uh, state operator. Okay. Uh -huh. uh, and we do have, I think you know about this one. So we do have openings um, uh, in different dogs. Um, uh, and this is a really good place. Uh, we have tons of data, and we have a lot of thing, a lot of work that we need to, or like we need to set up all these infrastructure around this one. And it's kind of a great opportunity over there to basically show your impact as well. So if you guys are interested in all these open role, uh, open roles, uh, please hit me on my email, and I provided my email over here. And um, I have also put this presentation at this link, so you can go and check. Uh, and um, Beam Summit people are also going to upload the video as well as uh, uh, this presentation, so you can have you can access from them. And ask me if you have any questions.